Hello world, I'm your host for this wrap of some of the best talks and coolest speakers at PG Connects London, the Global Games Conference. My first guest up is Kelly Vero, CEO and CTO of Naked. We chat about Web3, her specialty, but we also cover digital, death, and Davos. Yes, so listen in, learn, and love this episode where I chill and chat with Kelly. I've been stalking you. We'll talk about that later. Maybe others have. I've been thinking about you. I've been saying, got to get Sean, pg.biz. For one, we have to say hi to Brian. Brian. Brian, yes, because Brian inspired me. Well, I met you before Brian, actually, but he's, you know, had you up at Scottish Games Week. And I thought to myself, Kelly, got to sit down, got to have a chat, got to actually talk about you because, you know, everyone is more than a title, right? I try to describe you. How do you describe yourself? I always tell people that I don't belong here. Even though I've been here for 30 years, I've been in the games industry for 30 years, but I'm a bit of a square peg in a round hole. I do a little bit of everything across video games, but now also across the metaverse, IP, anything really. Um, but I guess I would des describe myself as a developer. I am a developer of stuff. Hey, it makes sense now more than ever because now it is at the intersection of everything, yeah, right? It's yeah, games, yeah. it's development, it's metaverse. And hey, congratulations are in order because I heard this amazing news about Davos. Tell us about that one. Yeah, um, so I decided in my foolish wisdom, no alcohol involved, that it would be a really great idea to enter a startup contest with our company Naked. And we won first prize in Davos uh, for innovation as part of the Davos Innovation Week um, at the World Economic Forum. So yeah, I was pretty stoked, but I was more shocked and surprised when they read my name out because I just thought, what? Are you sure? You got the right person? You don't mean that guy behind me? They said, no, come to the front, come and get your award. And I was as surprised as the next person, yeah. What was the prize for? What was it recognizing innovation in Naked or what it was, was it about? It, it was for recognizing innovation. So what Naked does is we're a little bit five years ahead of everybody else probably. And we're looking at driving insights and data about Gen Z and Gen Alpha through digital models. Um, and we work with brands on one side and video games on the other to make that happen. And I think that was the thing that kind of pushed us over the edge because I think they thought, wait a minute, we spent so much time living in the present. We're not thinking about Gen Z and Gen Alpha, which is exactly what people should be doing because those folks are coming for you in a big way. The other thing that's fascinating and why I put it a little bit on pause. So I stand corrected. All right. Cause I was like, for me, you're a metaverse diva queen, what have you, you are shaping it. But then, you know, we all lost a little bit of the love and a little bit of the enthusiasm. And I did so many interviews in the past couple of weeks. It's just like, well, you know, it's cooling, it's readjusting all these different words that we're using to describe it. But you do not share that view. How can you be so bullish? Because I think it's really impractical to just create for today. I just think, you know, the day ends when the sun goes down. What have we got for tomorrow? You know, you've already sunset everything that you designed for yourself today. So what are you thinking about next? That's what I go to bed thinking about every day. What are we doing tomorrow? What are we doing in two years? What are we doing in five years? What are these people doing? Where are they going? What's the new hot, exciting thing? What can we get involved in? And it doesn't mean that, you know, just because markets take a little bit of a pause or a downturn, that that should deter us from continually creating. Technology moves fast and we've got to move faster and we don't. And I spent some time out in Asia last year. And, you know, the metaverse is driving. Web3 is driving out there. It is doing great business. And here we are just contemplating our navels, thinking about today. How sad. So you're in Asia, and we all know that cool stuff and trends come from there. So what have you seen? What's the most, like, surprising thing you've seen that you're saying that is where we in West will be sooner than you think? 
Well, esports, you know, is a national pastime now. In I was in South Korea, and uh, that's a national pastime now. The the people that are on esports teams now are treated like pop stars, like film stars. They are idolized. It's insane. This is a really big space, but also they're esport in everything. So they're not just kind of doing the League of Legends y RPG type experience, the MOBA. They're doing battle arenas with everything from robots and cars to, you know, there, there's some weird stuff at the moment like VR cockfighting is really big in the Philippines, and, which is a bit nuts. But, you know, people want to watch sports, whereas previously we would be happy to sit in a boxing ring and watch people physically take, you know, strips out of each other. Now we want to watch that virtually. It seems kind of odd, maybe on the surface, but they're really just shifting their attention slightly away from the thing that they're super interested in and replacing that thing with digital technology, which I think can only benefit an economy. Um, I've always been a big fan of digital first development for everything anyway. And I now think it's just taking its natural steps towards also have to remember that the things that we're creating now that we think we've invented APAC regions to the ages ago, cr cross-platform development is absolutely huge and it's just getting bigger out there. So I play a game in an internet cafe. I then pick that game up on my cell phone. I carry on with that game on the tram, on the way home, on the metro, whatever. I go home. I pick it back up again on my console or on my PC. Console sales going down. PC sales are going up mobile sales are going through the roof mobile is still a big winner in the apac regions what are some of the uh, experiences you had there we talked about you know virtual cockfighting and you understand the culture from there but what can you actually take or what might you even be taking and bringing into naked we were really fortunate to meet with the guys from zapetto and the guys from Spatial, two massive metaverse platforms, their focus is hugely on Gen Z and Gen Alpha. And what they want to be able to bring them is brands. But the kids, they don't want brands like right now. They're not into it. What they want are items, assets, things that they can take with them, things that they can put experience points into and then mint those items and assets to create nfts and then carry those those things around with them for life or trade them in to buy a new jacket from chanel or forever 21 or balenciaga or whatever i think it's quite interesting that the entire product life cycle process is pretty much sewn up now which makes things super easy for what we're doing at naked because being digital first you know we don't need to actually have anything physical before we create a digital property which can then be branded and sold inside video games then back out closing the physical circle so bring me to the evolution of naked because it's been a couple of years watching this and i'm hearing something very interesting here about data so it's more than the expression. We were talking, it was always about that passion of expression in you and building worlds and, and, and making the guardrails yourself. Yeah. Now you're telling me about influencing behavior, but at a very, very, very exciting level. I mean, it's amazing the way that it, this area has exploded. We take a, a beautiful dress like you're wearing today we pull the data from that dress. So how is it made? Where was it made? What is the product number? What did it sell for? What it, all of this information. We digitize it, bake all of that information into the actual model itself. Place that model with a unique identifier directly into the video game. And we're able to trace the entire life of that item. Meaning that every time Gen Z or Gen Alpha interacts with that object, we get that feedback. So we're getting the insight. We're knowing where they're wearing it. We know that they're going to take it out of the game and say, mom, or, you know, I've got money. I really want to go and buy these Todd's loafers or these H&M jeans or whatever. And this is great because this is going to lower returns and therefore cure the landfill situation. You know, everybody 
makes these big claims about, I can save you 25% on landfill waste. It's a load of BS. If you can save a company 2%, you've already won the race, you know? And I think going digital first for everybody is exactly what we wanted to do at Naked. And that's why we're really going for it now. We just did a big deal with a huge company. Uh, wow. It's, you're going to see a huge fashion emporium in the next year or so appear on every single video game. Fashion is coming for video games in a big way and we will not be able to stop it. And it's all my fault. <laughs> and I'm all right with that. But this is really different from Naked because when I first met you, I was like, I have to say it, excuse me, but holy shit, what a woman. I will never forget, actually, you were on a panel, all men only woman there and you just came in and just blew them away and you were talking so openly and freely about sexuality and 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 being yourself and you certainly are yourself oh, i mean yes. there's this is this is this is unfiltered you live an unfiltered life yeah so where does that naked fit in with this naked well i think it's that isn't it i think you know, we're so protective of data. We're so protective of our assets and our inventory. I wanted to totally democratize it and blow it open a little bit and say that, Peggy, you can have that dress in every single game that you play. You can wear that dress. You can carry it around in your digital wallet. You can monetize it. You can turn it into an NFT. You can do whatever the hell you want with it. I mean, it's wrong for us to kind of, we are the creators of video games and we are the developers. We're the thinkers and we're also the doers. But we're not putting ourselves in the position of our users in thinking what I said earlier, what happens tomorrow? Are you there for that? No, no one's there for that. But your users are. They're thinking about what they're going to do. That's why we've got mods, right? People have been modding for years for this very reason because they want to bring a bit of themselves into what it is that they're creating. And I just wanted to be able to, you know, put that in a jar for a little bit and see what happened. The games industry was so reluctant to get involved in this stuff initially because they were like, oh no, data, it's, we're so protective of it. It so belongs to us. But data belongs to everybody. And data is being constantly developed when you're not there. It's a persistent entity. So what are you? Are you sitting on a stockpile of first-party data? Is that really where you're at? Yeah, we've got quite a lot. But, I, I mean, it's, it's weird because it's not coming from that traditional place where people are going through the usual motions of, you know, app-focused, you know, IAP, in-game advertising, getting the data, understanding the users. No, we're, we're putting it back onto the user and saying, here's the object, take it everywhere you would take an object usually, and we'll just measure it. And obviously, for the purpose of regulation, it's totally cleansed and it meets all the criteria and compliance, but it's really opening the doors for brands, for example, because now they get to super understand a segment of society that they would never have known. I mean, who really understands the Roblox generation? Not even Roblox. Exactly. Not even Roblox. I heard that panel. So help me out here, Kelly. I'm thinking this through and I'm saying, okay, I get it. Data, first party data, yeah. in the sense that you are seeing the cycle, you're seeing the stages. And I would understand why fashion brands would say, you know what, this is very cool because Gen Z, Gen Z, Gen Alpha, this is what they do. This is where they live. So I get that. That interaction is going to be gold. Yeah. How does someone interact with you? Not personally. Let's just talk business first. Personal would be very interesting. Uh, <laughs> no, business-wise, how do they do that? Because they are starting to see this. Congratulations. Talked about a deal. So you've got a deal. Fashion is getting this. But how does it actually work? And of that data, what am I getting with you when I interact with you? I mean, how much of it, I guess, is the question. That is an absolutely amazing question. The most important thing, actually, is probably not the data on the naked side. That's for the brands to deal with. We just literally farm it. The important part is the quality. The quality of the objects are so vital to the games element of this. You know, on the fashion side, or and we only really work with fashion, so they have got a real desire to see something that's of a really high quality. Of course, it's their garment. They designed it. But on the game side, 
Well, the games industry is so protective of every IP that they create. Put something into an engine that's going to break, it's going to break the entire game. That's just never going to happen. So that interoperability question is a really interesting one for us that needs to be solved. But furthermore, I think the interesting part about this is we're reaching games because we're leading by example. We've worked with companies like Alexander McQueen, Lulu Guinness, you know, Net-A-Porte, those types, Zalando, etc. So we know that we can do omnichannel as well as, or if not better than, Amazon. Yeah, Microsoft. Microsoft has the biggest omnichannel retail in the world. And we think that this is the new opportunity for games to really understand their user. Now, I'm not going to poo-poo any of the stuff that you do because I think you're an absolute genius in understanding uh, solutions with regards, metrics and analytics, etc. But I reckon, and I'm going to make a big pronouncement here, and I'm going to look into my crystal ball and say, I think in the next five years, we're going to be using digital objects to source that information for us. We're not going to be using pixels. Coming out of a couple panels today where it's like, yes, I'm just going to put everything in AI. AI will do it. Then I'll send it back into AI and chat to people like continually iterate itself. You know, I can buy into that. I can buy into that because the objects themselves will be the interaction. Objects are alive. Yeah. Objects are alive. They're a living thing. This dress, it's gorgeous, by the way. When you hang it up in the wardrobe, it's still going to be in the wardrobe the next time you go to it. It's living its life. Yeah. And like when you're not wearing it, it's still generating data if you want it to. And so that's what I think we're missing by just saying, you know what, we'll just attack, attach a pixel here and we'll get AI to sort of read it out and look for it and whatever. How boring. You know, there's so many different ways that you can do things better and those different ways are digital objects because they live with the player. You're someone who likes to push the boundaries, push the envelope. What, what? upsetting people as well, Peggy, as you well know. I do. I do. I, I will remember that. I just remember the, the, the looks. It must have been like four or five years ago. You were just like blowing people's minds. Yeah, that was before we had like panels with loads of women too, remember? Remember those days. Wow. Actually, some of those days happened yesterday as well. Oh, I saw some all-male panels. When they came off the stage and everyone was applauding, I said, yeah, yeah, great, guys. That was really, really good. Where are the women? We, well, it was an AI panel as well, and they said, Oh, yeah, well, we don't know anybody in AI. I said, hi, I'm Kelly. <laughs> and bring everyone with you. Remember, help them help them up the rung. So what I want to say is that, like, rules don't really exist no, for right. you. No. So what are you, like, the most frustrated by? What would you do if you could do it, if people would just get out of your way? I would place games in the same omnichannel position as the Amazons and the, the Microsofts of this world. I would completely democratize this experience for everybody. I think the thing that we need to really get through, actually, if there was no barriers, is, and sorry for everybody, especially Brian watching at home, or the boomers, you know, they're, they're, they're the... They're the decision makers currently on everything that we do. And we've got to get past this sort of hierarchical drain. It's not getting us anywhere. So I think that's probably what I'd do is destroy every single board meeting in the world to get games into a situation where they become the leading commerce channel in the world. Well, you did start off with the G-commerce. I've used that a couple of times in articles. I think that's only yours, by the way. Another thing that's yours, because, you know, you have to... You always have to affect change from within the system. Yep. That's the way it works. You don't come in and say, well, that all is the wrong thing and this is the right. You have to go through it. And you've done that in a sense because you've also published a book. Yeah. So it's knowledge sharing and it's trying to raise everyone up to the level so we can start to think a little bit with you about this. Now, I have to admit, I only saw that you published it but I haven't really delved into it. So give us I'm the top give level you view. you a copy today, Peggy. Oh, do I, I get an you. autograph? 
Yeah, sure. Oh, hell yeah. Okay, great. You're on. You're on. I love that. Well, give us a little bit of that. Give us sort of like, um, I wouldn't say the, you know, the condensed version, but what was the most exciting point or the most surprising point when you were writing it? Because, you know, when you write things, it's almost like slaying a dragon. It's like you didn't set out to do it, but you do it in the end. And it's like, wow, did I actually capture that? I'm amazing myself. Where did you amaze yourself in the book? Um, I think with the... Uh, going back over because the book is set in three sections is to sort of enhance verticals outside of video games as to how gamification and game development can help with every sector of society and so what I wanted to do was tell you the story of where we came from in the video games industry what those kind of you know circuit boards looked like 40 years ago what that arcade cabinet was like when you were playing pole position how there were tiny little teams in japan building huge games for konami and other sort of publishers you know how nintendo really started and th these sort of electronics companies that, that had a super idea that we now totally take for granted in our cell phones, consoles, etc. I think that for me, going over that really reminded me of what an awesome opportunity we have in technology and how we shouldn't waste that technology opportunity, how it's going to teach us, but as also how we can teach it, how we can tell it exactly what it is that we want, especially now with AI. But it, it really reminded me that we take tech for granted quite a lot. We just assume that when we want something, it's going to be there and somebody will have invented it or there will be a new device model that will be able to answer all of our needs and questions and problems when actually it all goes back to a handful of unfortunately men there were some women as well but you know mostly men that worked in these big rooms full of computers with the exception of ENIAC actually which is filled with women so they were all brilliant computer pioneers. Um, but, you know, the colossus of the world, these have huge laboratories full of computers. And we've condensed them and condensed them using Moore's Law techniques. And now we've got something really tiny. But we seem to be on a plateau. And I would love to be able to see with the advancements of spatial and edge computing where we'll actually go in the future with some of this technology i'm ready you know technology that's it when it's invisible it's magic but you pointed out we also then ignore it we don't really think of the applications we sort of have plateaued in a sense that it's like been there done that what else is there but they're spatial you said it was in three sections. Now you got me going. And I have a flight back. So guess what I can start reading? Yay. Yay. But um, where do you take us? Because you're always looking at the future. So you divided Actually, it up. You, t you, you did the evolution yeah. and the... Where do you take us in it? What, what, where do you want to you take us? Death. I actually take you towards death. Seriously? Yeah, talk about digital death. You know, it's the kind of last bastion of uh, technology really, isn't it? Where do we go when we die? What do we leave behind? Are we leaving a, a digital altar for people to leave tributes? Or are we creating a digital vault that no one can get in, that is a sort of Fort Knox that contains all of our secrets? And where is that server? And what does it do? What does it serve? And what will the technology principles be 20 years from now to be able to protect us? Don't forget that you and me are going to be the first generation that go through a digital retirement. So we need to plan for that kind of stuff. How are we going to navigate that? You never even thought about this. I love it. You never never I can see this. the cogs turning, viewers. I can, I can see yeah. everything in Peggy's eyes. All of a sudden, the alpha to omega. I was just thinking, though, because it sounds really far out initially, but I remember the discussions. You know, what do you do when you have, you know, all of your content and you can't leave it to someone? Remember there were those court cases, you know, someone died and I don't know, they've got some amazing, you know, vault of content and Apple TV. I don't know what it is, but I remember that. And now you've got me thinking, yeah, it's not just that. It's me as well. 
Remember that one time with the chip? You're supposed to have the chip. And then they said the joke was you won't need psychotherapy ever on the planet Earth again because the chip will ca capture your real experiences. So there won't be any like, oh, I had this horribly traumatic experience when actually you didn't. Chip will correct you, you know, and that was kind of cool for a while. So, so this, this, I, yeah, cogs are spinning here. A lot of you're, things you're are in, spinning. You're in for a really good read then on the plane journey home, I hope. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to take you through everything from the birth all the way through to the death and the metaverse yeah. in between. It's also like a really nice section in the middle about storytelling and how we're becoming much more uh, averse to the traditional linear methods of storytelling. You know, Steven Spielberg said recently in the last sort of 15 years, there are uh, no more endings to stories. There are only beginnings. Yeah. And that's true. Um, and I think that's something that we have to think about as we become, we become more content driven, more content hungry. We're going through a phase, I think, in life at the moment where we're in the McDonald's drive through of content, right? So after 20 minutes, we're hungry again. I like that analogy. That is pretty cool. And it makes me very hopeful because I'm hoping that, you know, we do consume content. That is consumable, you know, that is, that is worth it. A lot of people, you know, put a lot of work into these games. I put a lot of work in my articles about games and, uh, yeah, that they'll be hungry, that it won't be just, you know, snackable. And at some point, um, yeah, no more appetite. You've got an appetite for change, but you've also got personality. How do you find that you stay grounded so you can come to a show like this or speak in the industry where people are already and bring them with you? Because, I mean, let's face it, this is a time where we're talking about, you know, there is no UA without AI and AI is all about optimizing, optimizing, automating, automating. And it's not about breaking out and beyond that to look anywhere where, near where you are. So how do you talk to people when they're like, where's the money? Where's the opportunity? How long is it going to take? You know, the typical mindset of games as a business, which is part of it as well. I mean, you're a businesswoman. Yeah, I think we're, we're living in very mysterious times because games generally are at a saturation point. Um, we're in a really weird space at the moment. I don't know how anybody's making any money, but somehow it's happening. But I think this is because games are unwilling to diversify. One of the big jobs that I do in my role as CEO, naked and CTO, by the way, yes, I'm a woman. Um, I wrote all the tech. And also uh, in everything that I do in evangelizing is thinking like a little bit more about looking outside, educating, and yeah, evangelizing about different verticals, different sectors. Hell, I've mentored everybody from health tech and femtech to, you know, hyper casual and, you know, deep RPGs, rim world games, whatever. Um, and I find the same pain points everywhere. Of course, the main one is like, how do we make money? But the other one is how what is our timeline? What is our lead time before this marketplace gets saturated? Mm. How long do we have? You know, how much oxygen is in this room before we all start choking and falling on the floor? And that's, I think, one of the things that people coming into this industry don't understand. They don't see the lay of the land and they don't know what's outside that they could bring in those transferable skills and that transferable knowledge. You know, we're, we're not saving lives here. We're creating video games, we're creating experiences, hopefully enjoyable and memorable experiences, but you know, you, you can't make an omelette without cracking some eggs, you know? When you talk about memorable experiences, I couldn't hope for a better segue. Kelly, this oh has been gosh. memorable. This has been That's awesome. So We've gone. Was that link? It yes. was amazing. No, but it was. I picked uh -huh. up on it. It's like amazing She's experiences. Good. I was like, yeah, shit, sure, yeah. A <laughs> I'm going to be seeing you a lot, I can imagine, this year. There are different shows, different opportunities. There's a lot going on. But what are you looking forward to most? Beyond just seeing me again, okay? What are you looking forward to? Yeah, I love <laughs> to see you every day of my life. Hey. Oh, Kelly. Really? <laughs> oh, but um, let's say, you know, we're meeting up. What do you want to be telling me? What do you want to be saying is even cooler 
than having maybe one in a, your new invasion award in Davos or just, you know, talking to the companies you're talking to. I mean, what's, what's, what's this year going to be that you're going to say, Peggy, you got to hear this one? Oh, that is such a good question because obviously I'm quite deep in the weeds right now. Mm -hmm. I'm down in it. Um, and I'm really just taking in quite a lot of the things that I saw last year and starting to put together a strategy or roadmap about what's coming next. Mm. I really do think if you and I sat here this time next year, which we certainly will be, will be. I think this place is going to be split. I think it's going to be split between 60% traditional games and a 40% gamified experiences, applications, and other verticals. Because I've had some people visit here today, and they come from completely outside of this specialism and discipline, and this place blew them away. And they said, we need this in our industry. We need to have these people around us. We need to learn from the games industry. So I think there is a lot of great work that's being done here mm. that is going to continue into 2024 and beyond but i think it's not going to be focused on the saturation points inside of this space i think it's going to be much more far-reaching and hey next year i'll have a metaverse track as well right oh, i do hope so <laughs> i mean come on the, the metaverse is coming back in a big way. If you saw any of the talks today from blockchain and Web3, mm -hmm. you would say, I mean, Marcus Pullen's talk was absolutely staggering once again. And uh, I am really buoyed by, you know, this incredible, I, I don't like to say a bear market too much because I think it just sounds so crypto bro-esque, yeah. <laughs> but I totally feel bullish about the metaverse, oh, yeah. NFTs and Web3. I think they're coming back in a big way. We've got a great sponsor here at the event today from Nefta. Mm -hmm. There's some super cool stuff happening in this space. Like, mm -hmm. So I think we're going to get our track back next year. Cool. And I'm, I'm going to go lobby Chris now. Do that. And I'm going to check out NAFTA because, hey, it's a podcast series. We're growing and uh, got to pay attention to these things. And yes. that's why I said, this is it. This is fantastic. Kelly, what do I say? You've inspired me. You've like fed my soul, woman. Oh, I love you. I, I, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I'm so glad we could chat. Thanks oh, again. the pleasure has been all mine. I'm so glad that finally we got to sit down together. One brain against the other brain. I'm glad I could understand it this time. I think just like three years ago, you were just like, I would talk to you and I'd say, nope, nope, it doesn't compute. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want to be like, Did, yeah, it was like, no, no, no. But now, now, woman, this is your time. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thanks again. Thanks and thanks. Thank you, Brian. We'll do another one with you. This show is all about how to do your job better, how to make an amazing game, how to market it. And you have a say. So if you have a story or know someone we need to shine a light on, then we would love to hear from you. We want to hear from you. We want to reflect the reality of the mobile games market in all its wonderful complexity and strangeness. So if you have any suggestions for us, if you have any feedback for us, you can always get in touch. You can email us at podcast at pocketgamer.biz. You can find us on Twitter at pgbiz. And you can reach out to us through the pocketgamer.biz website. If you're interested in listening to all of our podcasts, you can find them at pocketgamer.biz forward slash podcast. And we would love to hear your thoughts on future shows. And we've got you covered on all the major platforms. So subscribe to the audio podcast, as Brian said. Look for us on YouTube. If you want to read it, hey, you can do that too, because we have a companion post for you as well on the pocketgamer.biz website. Tune in again for the next edition of the pocketgamer.biz podcast, and we look forward to speaking to you in the near future. Until then, I'm Brian Baglow. I'm Peggy Ann Saltz, and that's a wrap until next week. Yeah.